Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you an unusual camera lens that can actually see around objects. I know it's a provocative title, but you also know how much I hate clickbait, and this is uh, just real physics. So let me show you the setup. So the camera lens is this huge thing here with the Fresnel lens in the front, and we're going to be looking at these two dominoes. And if we come around the other side, this lens is so huge that the way this works is the camera actually goes down inside it like this. And so I'm going to mount the camera here, and then we're going to show how to look around that domino. Okay, so here we are with the lens at its normal setting, and I'm just going to adjust the optics and see what happens. Absolutely bizarre. The domino that's in back actually appears larger than the domino that's in front. Let me just push this back to its normal position, and you can see that it's clearly behind the front domino. So I'm not moving the lens or anything. I'm just adjusting the optics. Truly a bizarre effect. Let me show you a different setup. In this setup, I have push pins arranged at different distances from the camera lens, and the green one is smaller because it's farther away, because that's normal, right? But this lens does not perceive the world the same way that your eyes or normal camera lenses do. And so now they all appear the same height. If we go back, the green one is smaller again. So basically this lens has the ability to have different perspectives on the world, no perspective on the world, or even negative perspective. But you'll be surprised at how simple it is to build one of these. So let me show you how it's built. So this whole time that I've been adjusting the camera's perspective, all I've been doing is pushing this piece backward and forward. And it slides forward in the tube here. It's just some, uh, you know, particle board with the camera there. Normal camera lens on the camera. It's a wide angle. And at the end of this tube, there's a Fresnel lens, and that's it. So basically just moving a camera fore and aft uh, near a Fresnel lens gives you this crazy amount of control over perspective. So let's see why this thing works. It doesn't have to be a Fresnel lens, of course. It's just that um, having a really big diameter is helpful, and it's easier to get Fresnel lenses with big diameters. So conceptually, let's see how this might work. Like, imagine that you were an insect sitting on the lens here, looking this way at the dominoes. From this point of view, I can actually see the entire back domino just fine. But if you were an insect sitting in the middle of the lens looking this way, you would not be able to see it because the, the domino in front blocks it. So at least conceptually, we can imagine all the light rays hitting the front of this lens has the ability to construct all kinds of different images. We could have a point of view from all the way over here if we knew how to select the rays of light in there, or we could have a point of view from very close to the center. And how do we select how do we make an image out of all these different choices? As it turns out, it's, it's the aperture that does it. So we have this you know, infinite number of possible images we could create with a lens, and placing an aperture in the system is actually how we down-select all of those you know, possibilities into an image. And you know, as you know from photography, if you have a smaller aperture, the image is sharper because you've rejected some of those other possibilities. The fuzziness, in part, be comes from the, the fact that you have all these light rays coming in, and if you just mix them all together, you get blurriness. But if we down-select with a properly sized aperture, we get all kinds of control over what the image is going to be. And if you say, well, you know, I could just hold a lens up like this. This doesn't have an aperture. Well, in this case, the aperture is the, the lens itself, the whole diameter located at the plane of the lens. And as we'll see, the location of the aperture relative to this uh, lens's plane and its focal plane is actually critical to how we get this perspective control. So let me draw some ray diagrams so you can see this. So as it turns out, your eyeballs in pretty much all normal camera lenses have this routine where the aperture is placed very close to the lens. Critically, it's within one focal length of the lens. So if this is the glass lens here, we put the aperture here, and it forms this system known as endocentric optics. And so the trick is that this red line is a distant object of the same height as the black line, and the more distant rays will get focused to a smaller point or to a shorter object on the, on the image plane here. So this is very normal, right? Far away things are smaller. It's, it's the most obvious thing in the world, but there's no physical law that says it has to be that way. So if we change things around a little bit and we put the aperture at the focal point of the lens, the system behaves very differently. In this case, the aperture is limiting what can get through this whole optical system. So even though each one of these objects is still emitting rays in all different directions, each one of these is a point emitter, the aperture and the focal length of the lens are set up such that only a select uh, bundle of these rays gets through. And if you put the aperture right at the focal point of the lens, 
it's very specific in selecting these rays to only come from uh, parallel rays coming into the lens. So if you have two objects that are the same height but different distances away from the lens, they're both spraying light out in all directions, our system down selects to the point where it's only looking at the rays that are coming in parallel. So they actually have the same height on the image plane. You can see another side effect of this is that you can't see sideways out of this. The field of view is actually zero degrees because the lens is only accepting light that's coming in parallel to the optical axis here. So interestingly, your field of view in this case is only as big as the lens is. It's, it's maximum, which is why the front elements of these telecentric lenses are so huge. Some of them are ridiculously large. Like if you want to image a large object with a telecentric lens, it needs to be quite massive indeed, which is why we have this Fresnel lens here. And then if we take it a step further and we move the aperture behind the focal point of the lens, then the system kind of keeps going and then far away objects actually go through and uh, have a larger image on the focal plane. So in a way, this is a, a way of seeing around objects because if you follow the red traces, it's actually going over the top of this uh, black shorter object in front. So you can image around things. And if you had a really huge diameter lens, you can see completely around objects. So where's the aperture in my setup? We've got the camera in here sliding around like this. Here's the giant Fresnel lens in front. Where's the aperture? It's actually in the lens here. We can reuse it. So even though this lens has its own aperture, it still functions to down select all the rays that are coming through this giant Fresnel lens in front. So it still serves the purpose of creating this telecentric or hypercentric or endocentric system just by positioning where this camera is relative to the front of the uh, lens here. So then you might be wondering, why do we even have a lens here at all? Like, why don't we just take the lens off the camera and use it direct? Well, that's actually how I started this whole experiment, and I ran into a lot of problems. The issue is that the aperture has to be very, very close to the focal plane. So you, this thing whole gets crammed together, and it gets very difficult to uh, build a system that produces good images. But I'll show you what my first attempt was and where I ran into trouble. When I started this project, I thought I had a really good source for these. This was $5 on eBay, and it's a really massive, heavy, really high quality lens taken out of a projection TV. It has a couple of fatal flaws, though, that ended up ruining this thing. But even besides the fatal flaws, uh, I'll show you how I thought I was going to do this. I 3D printed this converter bracket and even got a aperture out of an old broken lens. And so I thought I positioned the aperture right at the focal plane of the lens, and I made this so that it would snap together like this. It actually goes on there. It's just very tight. And then uh, I, <laughs> I lathed out a plastic cap that goes on the camera so that when this whole thing is put together, uh, it looks kind of like this. Pretty cool. I thought it looked cool. It almost works. It's not really that great. It's not as good for demonstrating this as the Fresnel setup. And the reason is that this aperture has to be super close to the film plane that's in there. So you can see I even turned it down because I was really like, you know, really precisely placing this as close as I could get in there. And then I found out that the images are just not that good. When the aperture is so close to the image plane like that, you end up with all kinds of problems because the light rays are shooting really obliquely into the film plane sensor and that causes the problems. Another big problem is that this lens was probably made for a red, green, blue uh, projection TV. In other words, this only had one color shooting through it. Um, I can tell because um, it says x-ray critical part do not operate without this lens in place. So it definitely came from a CRT projection television and those are typically red, green, blue. So this lens is not um, chromatically uh, corrected. So in other words, it has a huge chromatic aberration and the image just doesn't look that good. Even a Fresnel lens can beat it, which is pretty interesting. If you want to replicate it, here's the setup that worked for me. You want a 200 millimeter Fresnel lens of the largest diameter that you can get. And there is a happy medium. If you get a Fresnel lens that's too short a focal length, that's a problem because then the aperture has to be very close and then your camera lens can't really suck in all the light uh, to make an image. And if you get a Fresnel lens that's too long of focal length, you'll be way back here and the system will actually have too much magnification. So if you put an object here, it's just too zoomed in to make a a nice experience. It's, it's best to have the least amount of magnification. So 200 millimeter here, 
And then the camera lens should be about as wide angle as possible. For these micro four thirds cameras, I'm using a 12 millimeter wide angle lens. And this is good because when it's positioned about here at the telecentric point, the uh, angle of acceptance into the camera lens lines up pretty well with the light coming in from the outside. So it, it works out well. You may have noticed something else about these lenses that's weird. Um, is it possible to make a telecentric lens that focuses at infinity? No, no, actually it is not possible. In fact, it gets more and more difficult the closer you get to infinity, which is why all of the examples I've shown you have generally stuff happening pretty close in front of the lens. And if you search around on the web, you'll always find telecentric lenses have specific ranges that they work in. So typically less than a meter of working distance for these lenses, even the big ones. And the reason for that is it just gets optically more and more difficult to make a telecentric system focus far away. It'd be nice if we could do it because then you could just take this lens and you know, aim it at the moon and inspect you know, tiny little rocks from here because it's constant magnification. Regardless of the distance away, uh, it's the same magnification. So it'd be nice to be able to use that feature. But as it turns out, it's just optically not that um, possible. You can't get a free lunch basically. Some quick construction details on this. I used my favorite uh, shaper to cut these parts out of um, particle board. And the reason I used this is because I wanted this to be relatively thick and cheap. And I didn't really want to cut a 3 8 inch piece of acrylic in my laser cutter. So cheap wood is the best way to go here. And then um, the tube itself is a concrete form. So if you go to like your local Home Depot or whatever store, uh, they sell these cardboard tubes in different diameters to pour concrete forms. But the funny thing is, they only sell three different sizes of tube, 8, 10, and 12 inch at my store, but there's actually close to, you know, 20 or 30 sizes on the shelf. And it's funny, they, they actually nest these to ship them more efficiently. So the same 12 inch tube could be, you know, 11, 11.5, 12, 12.5, and they're all stuffed together. So if you go to the store, you can actually fine tune which diameter you want um, if you know what you're looking for. And then the construction's pretty straightforward. I just glued all the pieces on, sprayed it with black paint, screwed the lens to the front, and added this little piece of black electrical tape to keep light from leaking into the edge of the lens. Um, these Fresnel lenses are very sensitive to internal light reflections, so just a little black tape to keep those light uh, reflections out. Another easy way you can experiment with telecentric lenses is to use macro extension tubes for your camera. And so, you know, the way these work is you put your lens on there and then connect this to the camera body. And normally what this is used for is focusing very close, closer than the lens is normally able to focus. But what you can do is put a black piece of material here with an aperture poked in it and then put it on your camera and make sure that the aperture plane is exactly the flange distance behind this lens. So now you have an aperture at the focal plane of the lens. Now you've got a telecentric lens. So if you put this thing on your camera, you'll have telecentricity. But the diameter, the front diameter of your lens will always be the limiting factor. So for this 50 millimeter lens, you're only going to get a field of view that's this big. So if we're looking at small objects, it works. It's just, um, you know, that's the limitation. Be sure and check out the links in the description if you're interested. I actually found quite a few good sources on playing with this and understanding the optics a little better. Um, I should also point out that there are uses for these things. It's not just a curiosity. If you're doing uh, metrology or production line inspection, both telecentric and hypercentric lenses are useful. Hypercentric, because if you have a conveyor belt going by and you want to inspect all the products on here, it's nice to have a lens that can look around corners, right? So if you're looking down on it with computer vision and objects are going by, you can actually see the sides of the objects at the same time without moving the lens around. That's, that's useful. And then also if you're doing measurements, having a lens that has constant magnification is great because you can measure the distance between holes on the top of an object and the bottom of an object and know that it's exactly the same because optically you're, you're not you know, making them small from being far away. So anyway, I hope you found that interesting and I will see you next time. Bye.